Light weaves in space and shines in matter. A world of images based on contrasts is created. A figure may stand out as black against white, as well as white on a black background. Each image has its counterimage, its complement, carrying the same information. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, in his theory of color, calls attention to the fact that in the same way as white and black are opposites, likewise each hue has a corresponding complementary hue. He studied simple pictures in black and white through a glass prism and found that colors appear in the form of certain series of hues or spectra, of which there are four basic kinds, complementary in pairs. On the one hand, those which appear at the border between black and white, and then either as a spectrum in yellow and red, or complementary as a spectrum in cyan and blue-violet. On the other hand, those which appear at a narrow stripe of white on a black background, respectively a black stripe on white ground. In the first case, you get a spectrum in red, green and blue-violet, a Newtonian spectrum. In the second case, you get a spectrum in lighter hues, yellow, magenta and cyan. Let us call it a Goethe spectrum. These two spectra are complementary. That is, if you try to combine them, they eliminate each other. You either get just white or just black depending on the method of combination. This beautiful symmetry demonstrated by Goethe is fundamental to color theory, but a more intriguing question remains. What does it tell us regarding the nature of light? As well as rays of light, there are rays of shadow. But are light and dark really equivalent entities? Monochromatic light, for instance, in the form of laser beams, is known to most people. But monochromatic darkness, what could that be? I'm going to show you a clever optical arrangement which demonstrates the existence of monochromatic rays of shadow. Our light source consists of a small 100 watt halogen lamp with a 2 mm filament mounted vertically as you can see. With the help of a condenser lens the light is concentrated into a parallel flux and sent through a big glass prism. There it is deflected and sweeps along a piece of white cardboard on which the phenomenon we are going to study are projected and made visible. We switch on the halogen lamp, turn off room illumination and screen some irrelevant stray light. We are going to perform our experiments on this light path. The light is colorless and the path on the board accordingly just white. As soon as an object is placed in the light, it throws a long shadow with colored borders. This is our stage. In order not to be disturbed by its colored boundaries, let us fade them out. The white band renders a flux of dispersed light visible, that is to say, light that has passed through the border between two material media, glass and air, thereby acquiring an inner order which remains invisible until we place something in the way of the light. With the shadow of a tiny splint of wood, I generate a Goethe spectrum characterized by yellow, magenta and cyan. On the other hand, I can place a screen from one side into the light and now obtain a blue boundary spectrum. A screen on the opposite side yields a yellow boundary spectrum. If I narrow the slit, yellow and blue meet and a Newton spectrum appears. It is characterized primarily by three colors red, green and blue-violet. Let us now introduce a refinement in the experiment. Instead of absorbing media, 
we will use reflecting objects. A small piece of mirror glass held in the sunlight gives us two images, a black shadow image and a white light image. We now place the mirror in the dispersed light from the prism and get a yellow-red boundary spectrum on the shadow side and a blue-violet boundary spectrum in the reflection. By inclining the mirror, I send the reflected light sideways out into the darkness. The original light flux is divided into two complementary parts. No light gets lost. Placing the mirror on the opposite side of the light path, we obtain, just as before, a blue boundary spectrum in the shadow and a yellow boundary spectrum in the reflection. Now let us see what happens if the shading object is a tiny square stick with mirror finish on one side. In the light direction it generates a Goethe spectrum. That light that is obstructed is deflected and appears as a Newton spectrum. One and the same experimental arrangement generates both spectra, one in light, the other in darkness they correspond symmetrically to each other. Here we see the optical arrangement from the other side, that is with the reflecting side of the stick facing us. We now exchange the stick for a plane mirror with a narrow slit on it. We thus obtain the complementary situation. A Goethe spectrum now appears in the reflected light as a shadow. At the same time, the light that slips through the narrow opening in the mirror reveals itself to be a Newton spectrum, which gradually gets lost in darkness. We are now ready to approach the issue of monochromatic rays of shadow. In his famous book Optics, published in 1704, Isaac Newton discusses the following experiment. He lets sunlight shine through a prism and gets a dispersed flux of light. A diverging spectrum appears behind a screen with a small hole. With the aid of another screen with a hole, a small part of this spectrum is selected and the ray meets a second prism. It gets deflected, but this time does not diverge into a multicolored spectrum. Newton considered this to be a convincing proof that white colorless sunlight is really not as pure as it seems, but consists of a mixture of various monochromatic types of light. Let us repeat Newton's experiment. We place a screen with a narrow slit in the path of a Newton spectrum. In this way, for instance, a red ray is selected out of the full spectrum and passes through a prism. It is deflected, as can be seen, without spreading out as a spectrum. The hue remains unchanged. Neither does a green ray give rise to any multicolored spectrum. And the same holds true for the dark blue-violet ray. They are all unchangeably monochromatic. Let us try the same procedure with the Goethe spectrum. In other words, let us select a part of it with the help of a narrow slit, thereby trying to isolate, say, a purple ray. Look what happens. As the white light passes through the narrow opening, a Newton spectrum is generated, as we have already seen. When the cyan-coloured part of the Goethe spectrum shines through the opening, the red part of this spectrum disappears, but green and blue-violet remain. When we get to purple, we find that the green disappears instead. That is, the spectrum becomes dark in the middle with a blue and a red ray on the sides. Coming finally to yellow, the blue-violet part disappears and red and green remain. The conclusion is that using this method, neither a yellow 
nor a purple, nor a cyan monochromatic grey can be generated. But have we not made an error in our reasoning? We have tried to produce the rays in darkness, in the shadow behind the screen with a narrow opening. There the rays of the Newton spectrum felt good, the red one, the green and the blue-violet ray. But the rays of the Goethe spectrum were kinds of shadows appearing in a flux of bright light. The purple ray must thus be produced in such a way as to appear in a white environment. How can we do this? Let us once again use mirrors with narrow openings and produce the ray in the reflected light. The clue to the solution of this problem was given by the Norwegian physicist Torge Holtzmark, who in a brilliant article in American Journal of Physics in 1970 theoretically clarified the perfect symmetry between light and darkness in geometrical optics. Imagine a mirror with a narrow slit placed in a flux of dispersed white light. As we have seen, in the darkness behind there will appear a Newton spectrum and in the reflected light a Goethe spectrum. If we use a piece of cardboard with a narrow slit to try, say, to choose the central part of the Goethe spectrum in order to isolate a purple ray, we fail to do so, instead obtaining two rays, a red one and a blue-violet one. And between these two, where we hope to find the purple ray, it remains dark. If we instead use a mirror with a narrow slit and with the reflecting side turned upwards, it will reflect a flux of white light of exactly the same kind as the one prevailing behind it. What happens now when the narrow opening on this mirror is positioned in such a way as to select the purple centre of the Goethe spectrum? Let us try this. The design of the main instrument of the experimental arrangement looks like this. Two mirrors with narrow slits are mounted exactly parallel to each other so that both reflect light in the same direction. They are placed adjacent to the prism and a piece of white cardboard is mounted onto them to render the flux of light visible. We turn off the room illumination and clearly see the Newton spectra emerging from the narrow opening in both mirrors. What is simultaneously happening to the reflected light? The rear mirror produces a Goethe spectrum whose purple coloured centre meets the slit in the front mirror. And on the other side it moves on, untroubled, as pure purple ray on the white path. If we put a small prism in the way of the purple ray, it is deflected without giving rise to any other colours. It behaves exactly as the monochromatic rays isolated from a Newton spectrum, as was earlier demonstrated. The purple ray thus deserves to be designated as a monochromatic ray of shadow. Let us now see whether it is possible to produce a cyan ray in the same manner. We send the cyan part of the Goethe spectrum through the slit in the front mirror, and behold, on the other side, it flows on as a ray of pure cyan. Let us finally put the small prism in the way of the ray and see how it is just deflected without generating any color spectrum. Even this is a monochromatic shadow ray. I will omit showing the yellow ray because of the difficulty in making it visible in contrast to the white surroundings. The conclusion of this series of demonstrations is to each monochromatic ray of light there belongs a complementary monochromatic ray of shadow. If you think that Newton's demonstration justifies the thesis that white light should be regarded as a mixture of variously coloured lights then the thesis would be equally justified that darkness consists of variously coloured shadows, which is plain nonsense. Darkness is void.
an all-consuming nothing. It does not consist of anything. In this case, our demonstration throws a shadow of doubt over the thesis of sunlight as consisting of monochromatic light rays. Rays of light are just images, as are the rays of shadow. The images and their colors are in light, are produced from light, and are mediated by light, but they are not light itself. It is the way things are arranged in space that is reflected in optical images. The essential inner nature of light is still not disclosed. Goethe says, First and foremost, let us remind ourselves that we wander in the realm of images.